Good afternoon, everyone. Being confirmed to me backstage that uh, you've spoken at a lot of tech conferences, but this is perhaps the first by candlelight? Yes, exactly. Uh, the candles are very nice. So you're a co-founder of LinkedIn. You were on the founding team of PayPal, an early investor in Facebook and Airbnb, and a partner at Greylock. Let's just talk tech for a moment. Um, one of the principles you write of what's happened in Silicon Valley and over the past couple of decades is really reaping the benefits of a network effect. Could you, like taking a giant step back, you know, uh, talk about where AI fits into that? And is the AI wave comparable to the network effect, potentially bigger, or, or how are you viewing it? So network effects are the question of that when you create a network, um, each additional node adds super linear value. And so frequently happens in communications networks, happens sometimes in, uh, certainly in marketplaces, you know, eBay, Airbnb, et cetera, and then also other places as well. And sometimes it can be visible and sometimes it can be implicit. Part of how artificial intelligence uh, comes out from this is if you look at the, 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 the kind of the resurgence uh, and the sudden amazing viability of current machine learning, deep learning techniques, it comes from massive amounts of compute. Uh, and, and significant amounts of data. And between those two things, it wouldn't have happened unless you were doing the, you know, how do we build, uh, you know, kind of server farms, farms of, of computers connected even between them with networks, and then being getting uh, data from lots and lots of different sources, including, you know, uh, from the fact that we've got, that we're, we're generating more and more data with all of our phones and all the rest of it. Like, picture counts and all the rest of it. So AI is, in essence, a emergent phenomena out of having built these massive networks of communications, compute, and data. Now, it's interesting because, to some degree, you say, well, then it's a network phenomena, but actually, in fact, it's a centralizing force because it's scale compute that really does this. Like, when I um, have been asked in other contexts, like, what becomes uh, scarce? when you get to all these new abundances that can possibly come up from AI, the answer is compute. Hmm. That's fascinating. Now are you, when you're making your investments these days, and I, I understand like hundreds, thousands of people pitch to you every year, are you focusing on AI? Like how much, is, or is, is that just like, you know, table stakes in a sense? So, uh, well one thing I always try to do is I try to do, my ideal investing is stuff that looks a little crazy now, and like kind of look wrong, and then three years is obvious or five years is obvious. That's, that's, the, that, that's where you get the best kind of uh, spread between uh, finding something early and then it grows into something super interesting. The, uh, the problem with AI is a, is a moniker that I would say probably a third to half of the pitches that come out. It's, you know, it's AI, but for X, or AI for Y. And so you're like, okay, now this is like a heated cauldron that everyone's looking at. Now that being said, the, the line of sight that we have with these current uh, kind of machine learning techniques uh, in just on what we have already, transforming fundamental industries is so amazing that we look very carefully about, because part of venture is how does the, how does the new um, companies, new technologies make new interesting things possible and how do you bet on that early? So we do look at AI, uh, at Greylock fairly carefully. Um, we look at both general techniques and also specific applications, you know, medicine, um, uh, you know, we've done a bunch of autonomous vehicle, um, investing, Aurora, Neuro, and those are uh, instances of where does AI kind of play into uh, a specific application of transforming logistics. Uh, you talked about what excites you about AI. What worries you, societal impact? Uh, Larry Summers was here earlier and basically said that he thinks policy-wise we're doing just about everything wrong in terms of uh, preparing for the inevitable employment impact. So was, maybe there's, I would say, three things that worry me. Um, and I'll, I'll save the one that's kind of most surprising-ish for the end, just because it's, you know, different ways to stimulate conversation. Um, the first is, um, we are, I do think that we will, over time, not in like, one year, but over time we will see a, a kind of a transformation of industry that's similar or move from agricultural to industrial. And so in that shift, uh, you will see enormous changes from where the bulk of people 
find jobs and employment and the kind of thing to do. And the first worry is, what does that transition look like? Because even though the move from the agricultural to industrial age unlocked the productivity that creates the middle class, creates um, you know, kind of all of this prosperity in education and learning and science and all the, the, just the GDP curve per person goes massively up because of it. I think we have the same similar potential, but that intervening uh, transition is super painful, and we want to make it as uh, as not as much suffering as has happened during the industrial age. In fact, as little and as easy as we can, we should be able to do that. The second thing uh, that worries me is like any kind of uh, super powerful technology, it's a little bit of the question of, 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 of can I, like, how do you shape it for best utopic outcomes and least dystopic outcomes? And um, you know, the place that I probably most worry about there in the second bu bucket is you know, people usually talk about, like, for example, autonomous weapons. And actually, I think about cyber weapons as the kind of more key thing. It's like what happened with the WannaCry virus that the contractor from the NSA sold to the North Koreans and was, and was deployed, you know, that kind of thing. Now, the third one, and this is the one that's, you know, kind of a little surprising, is because we tend to be, as humans, when we're confronted with some future that we're unfamiliar with, we tend to be hit the brakes, we're unsure. The problem is, is that, well, that, that like, it's kind of a simple two by two matrix. This group cares about human impact. This group doesn't care about human impact. This group slows down. This group still keeps building technology. Well, which technology gets built, right? And so it's kind of like, okay, let's try to make sure that we proceed towards building this technology with all due speed while paying a lot of detailed attention to, to, to shaping and reshaping and iteratively having the best possible impact on humanity. Mm -hmm. This kind of gets right to the theme of your book, uh, Blitzscaling, where you, you advocate speed um, over almost all else. Um, and in some ways, it seems to run counter to a lot of the narrative around Silicon Valley right now. Like, if anything, the move fast, break things seems to be prompting questions. So part of the thing that, um, you know, competition in business. Like if you're an individual business, you prefer to have no competition, you prefer to have a, you know, kind of a smooth downstream sailing and it's all very easy and you set your own time clock. And the answer is we live in a global world. Uh, and so the, the time clocks of these, of what, of what kind of sets the competitive pace is not set by my own kind of willful desire to just stop on the accelerator because by the way, it's always helpful to be able to have more time to be able to, to make that happen. But because we, we, we do this kind of uh, competition as a driving force for innovation, for new products and services, new innovation, that's what sets the time clock. And so the, the thing that I was illustrating in blitz scaling is that one of the reasons why so many amazing technology companies continue to come out of Silicon Valley despite the fact that everywhere in the world recognizes that technology is important, there's super great talent everywhere in the world. Everyone in the world says venture capital and entrepreneurship is important and venture capital is the easiest to go. Why does so much mix continue to happen here? And it's the understanding of this network of learning about the playbook of the first to scale is what wins the competitive race. And what are the set of things that you, you do in order to do that? And so that's why I think it's super important. That's why I try to share it with the world to try to, to enable, because the more places that we have of entrepreneurial strength uh, is really important. Now, again, part of the reason why I wrote the book was to be evolving the practice as well. So part of the reason we have a, a chapter in there called Responsible with Scaling is to say, look, you need to maintain that speed coefficient. You need to be able to do it. Because by the way, same two by two matrix. If the one that says, okay, I'm gonna slow down, and I'm gonna you know, kind of commission a blue ribbon, you know, make a blue ribbon commission, and I'm gonna study this and everything else, then I'm not gonna be the one making the rules. I'm not gonna be the one that has defined the new ecosystem. Eat or be eaten. Yes, so you have to get there. But there are ways to maintain that speed and invest in responsibility. Like what are the risks that you're taking as you multi-thread your organization? Make sure one of the threads you're hiring is people who are identifying proactive risk. 
what are the places we might go wrong for society or for individual customers, or, and what are the things that we could do to, to kind of, sh to, to, to prep against it, to prevent it, to, to, to think about, well, if that actually happened, what would we do in order to fix it really fast, and could we make sure it wasn't too bad? You know, that kind of thing, and, and you could add that into your speed to scale playbook uh, relatively easily because at the time that you really start uh, the kind of the blitz scaling takeoff is also when you start adding a lot of employees, you start multi-threading your organization. So you say, well, add these to the threads of what you're doing. So let's talk about Facebook for a moment. You were an investor, uh, you wrote, when a lot of people doubted Mark's broad vision of the company. Um, and I guess the, you know, move fast, uh, uh, mantra has been uh, adjusted a bit along the way to don't break the infrastructure. But, but what is your take on what's happening with the company now? I'm sure you are close to a lot of people there. Um, there's a lot of fundamental questions being raised and, and should we be, you know, should we be re-examining the move fast break things model? So one of the delights of doing this podcast, Masters of Scale, is I did an interview with uh, Mark and and I had gone in there with the kind of the standard thinking that was like, oh, the company grew up and move move from move fast break things to move fast with stable infrastructure. And so I asked the question of Mark that way. You can hear this on the on the um, on the uh, uncut version of the because uh, we make these composed versions of Masters of as the, the full interview. And um, and he said, no, no, it's the same principle. It's still about moving fast. It's the problem is if, you, if you're trying to move fast and you're out of size where you're breaking your infrastructure, you're actually moving slower. So it's still a speed to learning, a speed to growth, a speed to development. And I do think that one of the, the things that's true about, especially technological business, but modern business, when you were living in this more, this network age, this hyper-connected age, is, is competition come from anywhere. So competition is super important, and so speed is super important. Now that being said, I think that part of what's going on with Facebook, and you can see it over the last two years, and this is said as an outsider, uh, you know, no, no inside information, is that they're trying to figure out and grapple with the fact that when you move, as you know, because we talked about this a little bit in blitz scaling, from a startup to a scale up to an ecosystem to part of social infrastructure, what does the play look like here now? Like, what are your responsibilities given your social infrastructure where you're, you know, kind of social and communications infrastructure like Facebook? You know, logistics infrastructure, which you're seeing coming with Uber and Lyft, you know, all these different things. What, what happens in terms of what's the way that you should be in dialogue? How should people trust you? Um, how should they know what your intents are? How, what are your responsibilities for how does society play out? And I think they're, they're working their way through that learning curve. Um, you know, critics say they should work their way faster, they should learn faster. Um, uh, critics sometimes call for, you know, various forms of government regulation. I tend to be a little skeptical that that will be positive impacts, not because uh, that there is good intent and the, the and the and the and the responsibility to society is important, but I tend to think more like, well, we should create an organization that's you know kind of like the MPAA or something where where the time coefficients of we want to see these impacts for society, organize the industry in a way that you're responding to that versus. We're trying to be technologists ourselves, and we say you should do this and not do this. And it's like, yeah, but that, that was five, 10 years ago, <laughs> right? Like, how do, you, how do you maintain, you have to have solutions that maintain that adaptive speed. So with that, I would say, look, I think the, the, the Facebook folks are good people and they're trying. It's a little bit of a bewildering thing to suddenly say you're part of social infrastructure. <laughs> so you can see it in a sense that as you get to be a company as big and powerful, as Facebook, that there, there may need to be some more thinking about the implications. Oh, for sure, and actually, uh, look, I think that you've got to think about uh, how society is a customer, almost. Like, what is, what is your, as you get to a certain scale, how do you now say, I have responsibilities, not just to individuals, not just to customers, not just to employees, not just to shareholders, but responsibilities to society, and how, and how are those expressed? Now, part of the challenge you end up with, and Facebook has this in an unfortunately acute way, which is you've got one half of society, kind of progressive left, etc., saying, well, you have a responsibility for making sure there's only truth and information and people aren't in filter bubbles, and so you have a responsibility for editing the content that's going through your platform. And another half of society is yelling, uh, you've got liberal bias, you're trying to silence conservative voices, 
your attempts to do editing is all about editing us, right, as a way of doing this, you go, okay, well, they do need a kind of some version of a socially coherent voice to say, look, we would like you to, to shift patterns of sharing and communication the following way, and here is the moral authority from a legitimate social perspective in how to do that. Because being caught in between these two forces, arguing for diametrically opposed things, really sucks to be there. Yeah. <laughs> so you brought up politics. Um, you recently apologized for being linked to a group that funded misinformation in the Alabama Senate race. I know you don't really want to talk about specifics, but could you, could you talk about your case for engagement and why um, someone uh, with your success and resources should should be politically active and will you will you you know has this changed your view uh, it has not changed my view um it's uh it goes all the way back to voltaire and probably earlier but i prefer to call it spider-man ethics because i think it's fun <laughs> right because most people more people have seen spider-man with power comes responsibility and great power comes great responsibility probably there's probably some greek you know solon or somebody way back when well, i was the first the Senate reported for worship and fashion. Um, and so, uh, so I think that we all have, citizenship is not just entitlements, it's responsibilities. And if you're lucky enough and fortunate enough to be, to have gotten into a position of some power and some particularly means um, within society, you have greater responsibilities. And normally I prefer to avoid politics whatsoever. My, my, my previous way of engaging this was, Identify good leaders, help them as best I can. You know, yes, money in campaigns, but one of the things that, and even now, politicians find is I don't say, well, I'm giving you money because I'm expecting you're going to implement policy X. I've thought you're a good leader. You're going to process data well, you're going to make good decisions. A bunch of those decisions would be different than I would make. That's fine. That's because you're the person in the spot making the decisions, analyzing the information, seeing what's going on. And then help as best I can, right? Them kind of be in the positions of, of running for office or being in office, giving advice on things I know, entrepreneurship, technology. What made you know things different is, uh, and you know people in the audience may know this, like I I find Trump's running the office as a reality television show versus a theory of governance to be exactly wrong, and so I made a uh, a card game called Trumped Up Cards to kind of as a knockoff on Cards Against Humanity on this. And I got involved directly because I think of that as a disaster that compounds every month. And, and that's, that's why I got, in the, I got into the details of it. Because otherwise I would not, um, I would be just kind of like choose some good leaders, help them, they'll call me when they need help. And, and I prefer to go build things like entrepreneurship and, all, and whatnot. And the reason I'll continue is because you, ultimately don't have a good long-term future if the short-term is gonna be blowing you up, right? Like if we're gonna be, you know, kind of destroying our alliances, um, you know, kind of uh, creating a climate of fear and mistrust in ways that the you know, people who should be our natural, how do we shape the future of the world go, well, we don't trust you anymore. You know, that's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna to get to questions uh, before we do. Um, Misinformation, just broadly, is this, it almost seems like a societal fallout. Um, it's not, there's not a misinformation startup that can solve this, but it's, but it's a problem on the right and on the left and everywhere. I mean, what are your, uh, and a lot of people fear that with, you know, it gets back to Facebook, that, that with technology and perhaps AI, it will just increase polarization. Well, it could, um, and it's a worry, because in a democracy, it's how do we make decisions together? and accuracy of information is really important. That was a central part of the kind of post that I did in December saying, look, this is what I stand for, is, is truth and information where we can make decisions about it and try to have a better outcome for our democracy and for society. And so um, I do think that the, I guess what I would say this is, I think it's an urgent problem we need to solve as democracy. I do think there's ways that technology can help but we really need to get a lot more clear about uh, kind of like, well, which parts of, of, of information are um, kind of normal political process with free speech and the ability to say, like, I want to assert as part of my political campaign that the moon is made out of blue cheese, yeah. right? I, I hear a lot of the anti-climate change in a similar way. It's like, oh, there's no science. So, actually, in fact, there's some pretty good science. 
what the actual curves look like. We can dispute that, but there's some actual science here, and I actually tend to be a pro-science person. So, look, what what about what counts as misinformation or not, and what does that mean for how we how we how we shape what public discourse looks like? Uh, and I think that that's an important thing to get to as a society. I think technology can help. I think technology can also hurt because if you basically said, well, it's a total free for all. We're going to only believe the people that we previously had a confirmation bias and a theory to believe, well, then that's going to be painful to work through. And we need to work through having a discourse about truth, about what is the where we should be going. And by the way, there's always room for dispute. Like, it's not simply like, you know, is this table here? There's more complicated things. It's a theory about what we're doing. But how do we have that, I think, as a, it's, it's, a, it's one of the central problems of the time. Uh, regulation, how worried are you about it? And you were you were saying backstage that, you know, in a sense there's a concern that slowing things down could put the U.S. at a competitive disadvantage over China, which you, I think, have labeled the land of blitzscale. Yes, exactly. No, it's, one of the funny things about going around the world from Silicon Valley is everywhere I went before China I felt like it was a little bit in slow motion. Because right? one of the things that, that, that Silicon Valley really works at is how do we operate at a fast clock speed in order to, to to invent the future at scale uh, more quickly than other efforts as a way of doing that. And China makes me feel like in slow motion, right? So I was talking with uh, Lei Jun, who is the CEO and founder of Xiaomi, um, and I think this was when there were 10,000 employees. He's like, well, you, uh, you Silicon Valley people, you're lazy. You should come by and visit me. I'm like, what do you mean? You know, I'm not usually used to be called lazy. Uh, and, and he said, well, we have a 996 policy. 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week, you're discoverable at your desk. And that's when we're at 10,000 people and growing. And I was like, all right, I'll come visit you next Saturday, but I'm certain everyone's going to be there. And I talked to executives at Xiaomi who would get called at midnight, woken up saying, we're making a decision right now, come into the office in order to make the decision. And just the, the pace of doing things. And that's part of what the clock speed of a modern connected world looks like. And, and you have to adopt your strategies uh, based on that. Because unless, and human beings are a fractious group, I don't think we can all get together and decide we're all gonna move half speed, right? Like, if, like I just don't think that, I think it packs. you know, I just don't think it's gonna work that way. And so, look, if it did, great. If people can persuade, like, you know, all the major governments and economies got together and said, we agree, half speed, great. I just don't think it's very likely. Questions, anyone? Okay. There, oh, okay. This is super fun by candlelight. Hey. Um, so, as I understand the blitz scaling model, you've got these very successful, capable people in this networked environment responding to strong signals and just moving up off that and building off on it. And government, you know, in some ways at its best, works by helping old people, children, weak people, and, you know, people in a position of weakness. It provides them. And it has kind of weak signals and a slow process. Is government and the blue scale company just at permanent odds, or does government change in its behavior? A classic Quentin, good intellectual question. Um, the, uh, so I think that there are impedances. There's time impedances. There's target of goal impedances. So I think there's natural impedances there, to the prices for the question. Um, the, but I do think that there's ways, that was why I was gesturing at the earlier thing, is to say, well, we think you know, these entities should be, for example, we think these entities should be uh, better at, like, I, I could, I, I, one of the problems I want to figure out is, how do we shift some of the incentives for investing in human capital? How do we say that there is an incentive for investing in human capital, because it's, it's the parallel as opposed to like, completely taking human capital out of the equation, because like, in a sense, the perfect revenue per employee is like, well, our our, our entire company is automated, <laughs> right? And so, how do you how do you say, look, investing in human capital is a good way, and you have incentives for doing it? So, I think that the impedances are real, but I think that there's ways to say, and there's a little bit like the kind of MPA like organization to say, we would like you to figure out these problems because we don't have the time scales or the um, or the capabilities to figure out this stuff. And if you don't, then we'll just have to act in some way that we think is better for our, our weakened constituencies because they need to be included too, which is an absolute baseline. And so that, that dialogue is the dialogue that I would like to see happen. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, there was an additional question. Hi, Reed. Uh, this conference is about, uh, a lot of the content here is about how to be more thoughtful about how we are approaching AI. Uh, but at the same time, in the tech world, things are moving at a breakneck speed, uh, and people are innovating like crazy, especially around AI. So, A, how do we balance all of that? B, uh, do the companies who are being more thoughtful have a risk of losing out when everyone else is moving so fast? So the high line is how to figure out how to be thoughtful and move fast. Yeah. Right? So you want to be thoughtful, right? It's not not thoughtful. And part of that is to ask the questions uh, in the right way to say which, like one of the things I did in the, the responsible blitz scaling section of the book was to say, well, what's the severity of impact? Is it systemic? Is it something you could refactor later? Like if you ask questions and you encounter risk, say, which kind of risk is this? Like is this a risk that, you know, the bomb's gonna go off? Right, and the city's gonna die. Okay, don't move fast on that. Get that right, <laughs> right? But if it's kind of thing, well, hey, you know, um, you know, maybe, like, for example, we might contribute to some congestion in the city, and then we'll have to refactor how the network works to actually make it throughput better, and we all have all these network nodes in order to do that, and we could refactor that later, well, then that's one way we could get more data and then sort that out as we're going. And so you kind of identify which, which are the risks you are, and you can, do that in a way that when you're still moving pretty fast, because that doesn't say slow down, have every answer to everything before you go anywhere. And then when you get to AI, the kinds of questions you say are, well, which are the places where this could go wrong? Do some red teaming. Think about like, you know, what could go wrong. Like, is your data set potentially seriously biased in, in which you'll be enshrining it, you know, in a criminal justice or a credit score or something? Well, put that extra energy in, because that would be a real problem. If it's something that's like, oh, actually, in fact, we'll learn and we'll refactor and we know what the blind spots are and we're watching them right now and we're advertising where the blind spots are, then maybe that's something you could, you could continue to speed. And I think that becomes a case-by-case -case judgment issue. We are unfortunately out of time, um, but thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Please come back.